to take a little bit of time for this to come back on. But, you know, remember AP, y'all, likes to ask about particularly how the war or different events impact different groups, different parts of the country. Something you guys definitely should know. It's good for complexity purposes and stuff on it. So we went over the African-American soldiers, which if you remember, um, were not really offered the chance to fight in a lot of ways. They were made to be, as they would be in World War II, to be cooks, to be chefs, dig ditches, handle stuff like that. But one particular group, much like the Tuskegee Airmen in World War II, would distinguish themselves and represent African-Americans very well. You have the Harlem Hellfighters uh, who did as well, too. And of course, we mentioned this cultural diffusion thing where a lot of these African-Americans, great musicians, some of them intentionally basically hired or, you know, drafted for their musical ability in the, into this one unit, bring jazz to Europe. And the 1920s, y'all, the decade following World War I is known as the jazz age. And, you know, these guys can take some credit for helping make that a worldwide phenomenon. Um, as we said, they were treated better in Europe, uh, but when they came back to the States, um, they did get parades, they did get that, but for a lot of them, life just went back to being second-class citizens. Now, World War II African-Americans are going to make it kind of clear from the get-go that they're going to fight in this war, even though they're not being treated as equal citizens fully in the United States. But this time, they're fighting not just to end fascism, in Germany and imperialism in Japan, but they're fighting to end racism back here. They called it the double V, victory over fascism overseas, victory over racism back home, okay? Um, also, the other thing you guys need to make sure you, you're aware of as far as the um, as that goes is the, um, the migration. Um, the uh, the great migration of African Americans up north for jobs uh, on Saturday when I talked about the time after World War II, the so-called post-war era, we have a similar phenomenon of mass migration. In World War One, y'all, the migration was largely of African Americans for industrial jobs up north, and there were white Americans who left their farmers' jobs to be, you know, to work in factories making good money. And even some went out to California, which was just really kind of starting to grow. But um, in after World War II, y'all, and even during World War II, we have kind of the opposite thing happen. A lot of whites, some blacks, start returning to the South for the factory jobs here. It was uh, the factories, y'all, a lot of them began to move to the South because we in the South, land is a lot cheaper for your factory. Unions. Um, are a lot less prevalent. And so you could hire workers for much cheaper and also taxes are much, much lower. So a lot of companies shall take advantage of that and they move south. And also our weather tends to be milder. You have air conditioning becoming common. So it's possible to live here in this godforsaken swamp. Um, and so you start seeing people moving to what after World War II becomes known as the Sun Belt. And you and I live in that Sun Belt to this day. Some of you, um, this might be the reason your family's relocated here. All right, so that was called the Great Black Migration or the Great Migration. Some people were trying to get away from the racist Jim Crow laws that segregated people. I mentioned Camp Logan with y'all yesterday, and that was probably the worst case of, of violence that happened during this war. If you mention it, on an AP test, and you're, they're talking about, you know, um, World War One. Um, your your reader will probably be quite impressed. They won't know you're from Houston, and maybe that's a reason you know it. But there was a riot. Uh, a uh, white, a couple white police officers roughed up a couple of African American um, officers or non-commissioned officers. A sergeant, I think, a corporal. When news got back, the soldiers were led to believe that these guys had died. And as a result, they rioted. They got their guns. They went out into town from what is today Memorial Park. They shot and killed initially some policemen, but then they just killed other whites. And when it was all over, over a dozen whites were dead. Probably about another 20 were wounded. Ultimately, 40 blacks were charged 
and when the trial or court martial it actually was. And remember, they rioted, they mutinied during war. That makes this extra serious. And as a result, they face the death penalty. And of the 40 men, 13 of them were hanged. Many people believe today that some of those men were innocent. They hadn't necessarily participated, especially in the killing, but there was this real rush to judgment. People wanted to find somebody, punish them, and make an example so this wouldn't happen again. So remember, Camp Logan, the riot, and all of that. Okay, let's uh, skip to this one and talk about civil liberties during the war. Now, it's a sad fact, y'all, but um, during wartime, um, lots of times governments exceed uh, their powers in a lot of way. They kind of feel like maybe it's necessary to do so, or maybe if you're more sort of jaded or cynical, maybe they feel like they can get away with doing things that they couldn't do during normal times. Now, um, we haven't seen this as much lately, although I can remember it just before y'all were born in the days after 9-11. Um, I used to believe and be aware of something that I believe we called privacy. I don't know if you guys ever heard that word before, uh, privacy, uh, you know, where you could send messages to people and things like that. And it wasn't necessarily being looked at by the government. You could get on board an airplane without taking off your shoes and your belt and emptying your pockets and turning on your laptop. All those things y'all are the results of 9-11, the, the terrorist attacks of 9-11 and also um, what was called the Patriot Act that we're still under today. The right of our government, if they suspect you of being a terrorist or talking to a terrorist to listen into your calls, to monitor your email and do all that kind of stuff. Um, we would have never done that y'all, but for what happened on 9-11. And so, and then you look at COVID, right? Um, if I had said to y'all in 2019, the year before COVID that, hey, Next year, our government's going to shut down the churches and the mosque and the synagogues. The government is going to mandate, essentially, that you take a very new vaccine. The government's going to require you to wear masks. They're going to shut down the schools. They're going to really limit the restaurant. Charles say, Mr. D, what you talking about? You smoking that wacky tobacco or something? You would have not believed that we would do that. And yet now, it's happened. A precedent has been set. And it means that in the future, they might try it again. Or maybe they've learned, hey, we went too far. We better not try it again. So whenever there's a major crisis, y'all, and like I said, this is the kind of connections AP wants you guys to make across time, across periods and things like that. You tend to see this. One example goes back to the Civil War. Now, Abraham Lincoln is by far my favorite president. Teddy Roosevelt's number two but Lincoln is my favorite president. But even Lincoln, y'all, when the Civil War happened and the Southern states were leaving, he went unconstitutional. He was worried that the state of Maryland might leave the Union. So Lincoln had arrested a lot of your pro-secession journalists and politicians, and he threw them in jail. And he didn't even really have a charge. He kept them there to keep Maryland in, in, the, um, in the Union. He really felt like if he lost Maryland, which would have left Washington, D.C., the capital, surrounded by seceded states, he might just lose the war. Now, what he violated is a sacred principle in our Constitution called habeas corpus. Now, in the United States, unlike a lot of countries, y'all, when you get arrested, the police within 24 hours have to bring you before a judge. They have to have the judge inform you of the charge and they have to either let you go if they don't have a real charge or charge you and keep you there. They can also, this is when they do bond or not agree to have bail or whatever. That is a right that we have that a lot of countries don't. Lincoln suspended habeas corpus. He felt the war was that serious, y'all even had a leading politician arrested and deported uh, to Canada or to the South, I think. Eventually, the guy made his way to Canada and came back to the United States. All right, jump ahead about 45, 50 years or so to World War I. 
Now, with all the anti-German propaganda and stuff going on, all the heated rhetoric, all the anger, uh, President Wilson decides that we need to really propagandize this war. We need to make this war popular for Americans. we got to get Americans to join. And you guys have already seen some of those posters, like, you know, Defeat This Mad Brute, and uh, the other one with the guy with the bayonet and his fingers dripping in blood and stuff like that. These posters, y'all, were made by a group called the Committee on Public Information. It was basically a propaganda unit. You don't tend to think of the United States doing propaganda, but this was an example of early propaganda during World War I. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it so much. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, I bought some for the kids on Saturday. I just, I, well, but I wanted to have something on Saturday. So yeah, well, we're, we're waiting up here Thursday. Awesome. This is enough fun. Okay. And uh, I don't know about y'all. Yeah. Well, but this is like our first really big example of it in World War One with the CPI. Yeah. No, we would never propagandize to mo these days, would we? That'd be wrong. <laughs> so you see this poster here, y'all, and you see how the Germans are portrayed, right? As this brutish gorilla. You know, with this young woman that he's probably going to sexually molest. Uh, you see that that uh, club with culture on it. And where are they? As we saw, they're in America. So they used artists. They used Hollywood stars, y'all, like you guys saw, Charlie Chaplin and some others to push the war effort. But it went even further, y'all, with what were called four-minute men. Now, the four-minute men, y'all, were used to basically go around and convince people about why we were fighting. They learned a little spiel, they had a speech, it took four minutes, almost exactly, and if they saw you in the streets, they might stop you, and you were expected to stop what you were doing, listen to them, and basically learn from these guys about why we were fighting. Before a movie would play, or between you know, reels in a movie, you would hear the four minute man get up and basically propagandize for this war effort, right? Now I'm gonna show you just a few minutes here. This is like two minute long video that talks about the four minute men um, and also about something called the American Protective League that we'll talk about on the next slide. So here we go. Well, we went into World War I. This was not a popular war and this is something that Wilson had to deal with. One of Wilson's first moves is to create a propaganda machine. The Committee for Public Information, headed by a Colorado newspaper man named George Creel. The committee floods America's newspapers with pro-government articles about the war, eventually setting up a newspaper of its own with Wilson. A government, government newspaper, y'all. He hated all reporters. He thought they were ignoramuses. So he thought this was what we really should have, a government-run newspaper. <laughs> The committee also creates the Four Minute Men, who propagandize for the war in short speeches in movie houses between the And in that four minute period, our men were trained to then get up and to give a short, pithy, precise uh, pitch of the war for recruitment or war bonds or whatever the cause might be. Hollywood stars join the war bond campaign. Wilson's government also begins a crackdown on anyone speaking out against the war effort. He approves the creation of the American Protective League, volunteers working with the Attorney General to enforce the war effort. They would conduct slacker raids. Slacker raids. Basically, people who were slackers who should serve but are staying out of the war. The government was selling to raise money for the war. Pushing liberty bonds. A quarter of a million private agents of the American Protective League are battling against dissent across the nation. Americans are spying on Americans. So that was one consequence. Now, we won't go quite this far in World War II, but does anybody know the ethnic group, particularly in World War II, that that really were suspected and endured probably some of the worst harassment in American history. 
the Japanese or Japanese Americans, right? In World War II, a lot of the hysteria would be directed towards the Japanese. Now, we, we, we were angry at the Germans, right? Um, but the Germans had not attacked us at Pearl Harbor as the Japanese had in World War II. And so Japanese Americans, y'all, were literally moved from their homes on the coast where many people thought they might be spies. And they were moved to Utah. They were moved to Nevada, even to Arkansas, y'all, and put into internment camps where they could be watched and monitored because of fears that they might become spies or even saboteurs, people who would blow up stuff to help them. There was never, ever a proven case, y'all, of that, of that uh, spying in the United States or uh, any type of sabotage by them. So um, we do have some similar things happen. And as I said, after 9-11, y'all, with the Patriot Act, you know, we also, you know, kind of did some things that we would never suspect. And like I said, with COVID, um, you know, we felt that this was, you know, I think we recognize now we probably exaggerated its danger. I mean, it was bad. People died, obviously, but we, we were worried. We just didn't know enough. And so we did things like closing the schools and mandating a lot of things that Americans probably would not put up with if there hadn't been this crisis. So this is something that you guys can kind of see. And if you make those comparisons in your essays across time on something like this, it could get you that complexity point, outside knowledge point, some things like that. Now, in World War I, the greatest hysteria was against the Germans. The Japanese were actually our allies in World War I. But in World War I, the American Protective League that you heard the video mentioned would help. Um, it was created to basically help what was called the Bureau of Information or the Bureau of Investigation, I should say. I think it was the Bureau of, in, of Investigation, maybe. Um, and today it is called, of course, the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Yeah. The modern day FBI, y'all, can trace its roots back to World War I. And even the first head of the Bureau of Investigation, J. Edgar Hoover, would go on to become the head of the FBI for almost 50 years, y'all. Um, he, uh, he was there. Uh, became one of the most powerful, most feared men in the United States. Now, it was created, y'all, to go after a real fear. There were German spies here. The Germans were not very successful in World War II in getting spies here. They had a handful, but most of them got caught pretty quickly. But in World War I, in World, uh, there were spies and there were actually saboteurs, people who had instructions, who had explosives. And their job, y'all, was to try to blow up factories, impede the war effort, and do things like that. Um, and so it was. there was a legitimate reason to be afraid uh, and to investigate these people. But of course, people went too far. Much like with the Red Scare um, after World War II, y'all, there were indeed communists in our State Department. There were communists who helped give away the secret to the atomic bomb. There were communists in Hollywood. But were they that big a threat? Should we have deprived so many people of their freedoms and liberties over that? That's the question that a lot of historians ask today. And we definitely, y'all, went probably overboard with the Germans. Now, among other things that the APL did, y'all, was they basically mounted this German anti-German campaign. Now, it wasn't just against German immigrants, y'all. German Americans suffered. And you've got to remember, next to the English and the Irish, y'all, our largest other ethnic group in this country were Germans. They'd come over in the 1850s. Some of them had been over here for three or more generations. And in their minds, y'all, they were as American as anybody else, but they found their businesses being attacked, you know, people painting stuff on their windows, smashing their windows, trashing their businesses. Unless you think that, oh, man, we would never do that today. Sadly, there have been a few isolated cases of some people attacking Russian businesses because of their anger over what happened in the Ukraine. One of the worst cases I heard recently was of a... Ukrainian guy who runs a Russian restaurant because nobody knew Ukrainians until this. And he runs a, he runs a Russian restaurant and people kind of banged up, threatened him and all kinds of stuff. 
and he's Ukrainian. He had to put up like a flag and like, I am Ukrainian. Stop doing this. Now, American orchestras were banned from playing Beethoven. Now, I don't know how much classical music you guys like or watch. I mean, but I'm a big fan of Beethoven. You know, he's one of the big three Bs, right? Um, you know, Bach, Beethoven, Brahms. Um, but uh, his music was banned in the United States. The German language was banned from being taught in school. You would think we would need that. Bach, who is my favorite classical composer, although he's actually from the Baroque era, um, he also was banned. So no more... Brandenburg Concerto, like you see here, one of my all-time favorite pieces of music. So none of that, right? So he too would be banned. Now, if you think you can't get crazy enough, y'all, German foods had to be renamed temporarily during the war. Now, a food that I cannot stand, y'all, maybe some of you like it and that's good, we ever run into somewhere at a restaurant, I'll happily share my sauerkraut with you guys, okay? Now, sauerkraut is made of cabbage, vinegar, some other things like that. I, I don't like it, and I, I respect anybody who does. My wife likes it, but I don't. Now, we even called German jaw krauts. That was a pejorative. You called them Huns, Jerry's, krauts, uh, or whatever. And so we renamed sauerkraut Liberty Cabbage. Liberty cabbage, because if you ate sauerkraut, wasn't that doing a German thing, right? And then even things like German measles. You would think we'd let the Germans still have their name attached to measles, but no, Liberty measles. I um, I had the German measles as a kid, and it was pretty doggone unpleasant. Um, hamburgers. Now, hamburgers, y'all, were a relatively new thing. They had started in New Haven, Connecticut. They were actually an American thing right? Um, at a place I think called Louie's, they started the hamburger. This is, of course, a really remarkable hamburger. If that was even real, I don't know. But, doggone it, that sounds German, because after all, there's a city in Germany called Hamburg. And what do you call people who live in Hamburg? Hamburgers, okay? So that became Liberty Sandwich, all right? I mean, this is just kind of silly pettiness that we did, but they did it. Now, lest once again you think, oh, our generation, we would never do anything like that. Well, during the war on terror, y'all, the United States, many Americans, I should say, felt like France was not supporting us enough in our war on terror. Um, at one point, they refused to let American planes on a bombing raid fly over France on their way to North Africa. And so some Americans, y'all, tried to start a movement to ban French fries. They would now be called Patriot fries. <laughs> it did not go very far, but I but I urge you guys, next time y'all go to Whataburger, McDonald's or something, say, can I have some Patriot fries? And just see what they say, like, get out of here, weirdo. Okay, now another target, another thing that suffered was beer, all right? Now, normally we wouldn't talk about beer, obviously, here, but beer, y'all, became a really unpatriotic thing to do. We've already mentioned because, you know, making beer, y'all, requires large amounts of barley. That's, what you, that's one of the main ingredients, but people also use wheat and wheat beers. They use rice and some of the American beers and all kinds of things like that. Well, that food was needed for our soldiers. So drinking it was unpatriotic, but even worse, y'all, was if you drank the main type of American beer, which was a style called lager. Now, there are two main styles to beer, ales, primarily from England and Belgium, and lager beers, primarily here. Since it had been the German immigrants who came here and started America's beer company, y'all, almost all Americans drank German lagers. So if you were drinking a German lager, not only were you depriving our soldiers of important, you know, resources, you were, you know, drinking something German. And why this is a big deal, y'all, it becomes the final justification for what becomes known as the 18th Amendment or the Volstead Act. Now, especially women temperance people, women had been the main victims of, of 
of men who were alcoholics and abusing alcohol, women had been slowly, y'all, getting states by state to ban alcohol. Maine became the first state. But over the next few dozen years, they got more and more states to do it. This was the final thing that pushed it over the top. Once three quarters of the state, y'all, had banned alcohol, the other quarter of the states had to go along with it. And so basically alcohol above 2% or more, y'all, became illegal with what's known as the 18th Amendment. It is in effect, y'all, from essentially 1919 all the way until 1933. Did it work? Did it stop people from drinking? Well, what do y'all think? Drugs are illegal. Do drugs, do the law stop people from doing drugs? No, I mean, they stop some people, obviously. You know, people don't want to break the law. They don't want to go to jail. But they also raise the price of these things. So people steal or people supply stuff. And so what we found out with the alcohol ban, prohibition as it was called, prohibition of alcohol, was that it created a really powerful uh, organized crime movement. You know, before y'all, there'd always been crime, there'd been gangs, but because of prohibition, you're gonna see these gangs become like massive organized crime movements, much like today, you know, you have various mafias and things like that. And it was all due to this idea that if we ban it, people won't do it. Well, good luck. Now, some German jaw even had to go so far as to change their names. Maybe your name was Schmidt. Nobody had a problem with that before. But now you wanted to sound American. So you would change your name to Smith. Maybe your name had been um, Johan. You become John. Maybe your name had been Brown, B-R-A-U-N. It becomes Brown, B-R-O-W-N, just because you got less grief. And this wasn't just an American, American thing. Over in England, y'all, uh, Queen um, or King, it was King George V. His mother and, um, and grandmother, y'all, had been of German background. So the family changed their German name to Windsor. They're now known as the House of Windsor because that sounds really British um, instead of their other name that they had that had been German. So you see people do that. That's the kind of fear that people had, y'all. So like I said, be aware of that kind of hysteria. Your knowledge of history means that when we get into situations like this, we need to be on the outlook for this kind of hysteria, this kind of anger, because it almost always happens. You should anticipate it and hopefully try to limit it as much as you can. Now, another overreach of our government, though, y'all, is the Espionage and Sedition Act. Now, espionage is, of course, spy. It's the French word to spy on somebody. Now, as I said, there was a legitimate fear there. There were some Germans here who were spying and our government needed to kind of check those out. But of course, they went way too far with this. Uh, and the Sedition Act, y'all, was basically anything that might interfere with the government doing its job, at least its war job. If you obstructed, if you criticized war policy, you could be arrested for sedition. Now, the first time we had tried to do something like this went all the way back to our second president, John Adams. While John Adams was president, y'all, he passed what was known as the Alien and Sedition Act. Now, aliens, of course, are immigrants, not, you know, the acid spit gripping character in all the cool movies. And so the Alien and Sedition Act, y'all, first of all, the Alien Act made it a lot harder for immigrants to become citizens. Now, they can't vote until they become citizens. But what Adam's Federalist Party recognized was most of these immigrants were voting for his opponent, Thomas Jefferson, and his Democratic Republican. So they basically doubled the time it took to become an American citizen, hoping that by then the people would vote for the, um, the Federalist Party of Adams. The sedition part of the Alien and Sedition Act made it a crime to criticize the president, to criticize the Congress. And people were literally put into jail for basically making jokes or criticisms of Adams or the Federalist Congress. 
and it eventually expired. There's more to it that we'll talk about on Thursday. All right, so jump ahead, y'all, about 120 years or so, and we get this new version of it. The Sedition Act here, as I said, it was, a, it was more targeted. You had to criticize war policy. You had to actually or try to incite rebellion against the government. But the big thing was if you did anything to obstruct the draft, you criticize the draft, you protested the draft, you could be thrown into jail. Now, here's a political cartoon back from the day, y'all, that shows uh, a person with a liberal point of view's fear about this Espionage and Sedition Act. Now, at the time, it was a bill. I don't think it had passed yet. But the title of it here, the caption, as we call it, is Must Liberty's Light Go Out? You know, and if you look at it, who's the main person here? Who, who is this, obviously? Not a trick question. Statue of Liberty, right? And we all know she holds a torch, right? The torch is light. It's liberty. It's education. It's knowledge. Lights represent all those kind of things. And the real title is of the statue is Liberty Enlightening the World. Okay. Well, what's happened to her torch? It's being taken away. What is taking it away? This bill. So literally, y'all, our liberty is being stolen if this bill happens. Obviously, this is a person who's opposed to this, this law, a person who's worried that we might be making the mistakes of the past, like the Alien and Sedition Act of Adam's administration, if you can make those kind of connections or future things that we would do like the internment of Japanese Americans in World War II. Now, I don't know about you guys, but if I were interned uh, and put in a basically a prison camp uh, for the duration of the war, I would not be exactly patriotic. But what's interesting, y'all, is a lot of these Japanese Americans wanted to prove people wrong. They wanted to prove to people that they were as patriotic as anybody else, and they volunteered to fight. Now, we wouldn't let the Japanese Americans fight the Japanese, which some of them wanted to do. We were too fearful that they might work together, but we did let them fight the Germans and the Italians. And the most decorated group, y'all, in, in American World War II history of our soldiers was actually the Japanese American unit. Like I said, they felt like they had something to prove. So these are various examples that if you guys can kind of connect some of those examples and fears, you're, you're doing what AP wants you guys to do. Now, ultimately, about 2,000 Americans, doesn't seem like much, but that's a lot of lives changed. People who went to jail, uh, about half of them did. A lot of them had, you know, they lost their jobs and had things happen. Um, you know, it was sad. Now, by far the most famous of them is Eugene Debs, the guy that we've talked about now off and on for a month or more. Um, Eugene Debs, remember, had been the socialist leader, uh, but he started out as just a union organizer. He was head of the American Railroad Union. And when railroad workers went on strike in Pullman, Illinois, he was just a labor guy. But when he saw how the government came in and just ruthlessly crushed the Pullman strikers, and then they sent him to jail for defying the, uh, the, the order to stop the protest, to stop the strike. He was radicalized in jail, and he became a converted socialist. Now, Eugene Debs gets sentenced to 10 years for interfering with the draft. And while in prison in 1920, y'all, he runs for, I think it was the fourth and last time as president. Now, think about it. He is in jail running for political office. Usually, y'all, you're a politician before you go to jail, but he's kind of reversing it for everybody. And one of the things I have at home is a button from that 1920 campaign, y'all, and it features Debs wearing his prison suit behind bars, and it basically says, vote for convict number so-and-so, so-and-so. 